Good evening and welcome to the Bible study here in Ballyclare Evangelical Presbyterian Church. And if you're joining with us this evening across the internet, we trust that you'll know something of God speaking to you, God dealing with you, something of God's word in your heart and God's spirit taking that word and applying it to you. Let's pray for God's blessing upon us now. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father and our God in heaven, we thank you for your goodness and mercy that has followed us again through another day. We thank you that we can be assured of the Lord who is our shepherd and of his constant care. We know that it's surely his longing to lead us into the pathways of righteousness for his name's sake. And we pray to that end this evening, Heavenly Father, that we may be able to to walk in those green pastures and beside those still waters. Give us your word and your Holy Spirit, we pray. And may we know the blessing for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, if you've been with us on Tuesday evenings, you'll know that we've been looking into the letters to the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3. And we've come in the last couple of weeks to Thyatira. It's the longest of the letters. And so we're taking three weeks over Thyatira. Um, And so so I'm going to read that passage again tonight. That's the third week that we've read it. But anyway, we're reading this passage. Revelation chapter 2, verse 18. Let us hear God's word. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet like fine brass. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you, because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality. And she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your works. Now to you I say, and to the rest in Thyatira, As many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan as they say, I will put on you no other burden, but hold fast what you have till I come. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels, as I also have received from my Father. And I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Well, we thank God for the reading of his holy word. Now let's turn to God in prayer. Our Father and our God in heaven, it is with joy that we turn to you. You're the God who is way and above and higher than I. We thank you that we can bring every worry and care and concern in life to you. To know that you have our lives in your hand. To know that you care for us. To know that you will never let us go. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the many examples there, um, especially in the Old Testament of those saints of old who walked with God. They had many stumbles, many failings, many falterings. But how wonderfully that you dealt with them. And we draw great comfort, Heavenly Father, as we see that you remembered them and you visited them and you loved them and you cared for them. And we praise you and bless you that we enjoy that same love and care and that we can be assured that though our circumstances seem to be strange and difficult at times, yet our God is in charge. Our God cares. Our God loves. Remember us, we pray, um, in uh, this gathering this evening and do good to us O God and cause your face to shine upon us forgive and cleanse us our many many sins there's no hiding the fact that we're sinners we're wrongdoers and we hurt you we disappoint you we fail you in a whole multiplicity of ways 
But we thank you that you are a gracious God, that there is uh, f- forgiveness with you, that you should be feared. And we pray, Lord, that we um, might, might know the forgiveness of God, but we pray that we might learn the fear of God. We think of the hymn writer, Oh, how um, I love thee, uh, he says, with those deepest, how I fear thee, how I love thee, with those deepest, tenderest fears. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that we, we may know that. We may uh, be careful to fear God in a day when men shake their heads and laugh and scorn. Uh, and all that was uh, done to the Lord Jesus Christ, we see repeated in today's society. And they, they ignore, they spurn, they laugh, they scorn, they shrug their shoulders, they, well... That they simply dismiss the truths of our Lord Jesus. But we thank you that we have had our eyes opened, our ears unstopped to this wonderful truth. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us, therefore, to take it most seriously and carefully and to love you and to serve you and to honour you in all our days. Bless, we pray, our families and those who are near and dear to us. Bless those in church who have particular problems and difficulties. Remember the nations of the world and our minds are uh, are very much taken in these days with what's going on there in the Ukraine. We don't understand all the the whys and wherefores, but what we see is awful. And we pray, Lord, if it please you, to spare that people. Um, And to remember that you have a believing um, people, that, that they may be in the overwhelming minority, but nevertheless, Lord, a believing people in that land. Deal graciously with them, we pray, and remember them with loving kindness we ask you to remember our children we uh, thank you heavenly father for uh, all that they are some are very busy they're getting ready for exams some are starting exams this week be with them and encourage them and bless them we pray and we realize lord some, some of these exams are going to be going for the next six weeks they'll be tired they'll be weary they'll be ready for the end of them lord help them and do them good and for for others lord who Um, are are younger and they're they're learning and they're coming to terms with school and what it means bless them and encourage them and help them we pray we thank you that we can turn all of these things to you knowing that you care for us asking your forgiveness asking your blessing asking your grace upon us and doing that in jesus name amen Well, as I say, we've been looking into the letters to the seven churches. And they're here in the book of Revelation, written um, from our Lord Jesus Christ. We have the Father here. We have the Lord Jesus here. We have God the Spirit here. And we've seen that very much the focus of the book is the Lord Jesus Christ. And the fact that he's certainly in, in these early chapters in the midst of the seven churches. It's simply stunning to think that the Lord Jesus is there in the midst of his church. He sees, he knows, and he speaks. And we've seen him addressing the seven churches, the messengers of the seven churches, these seven stars that he upholds, his language. And it brings home to us how careful we're to be. Christ is in the midst of his church. He sees it all. There's nothing that he doesn't see. Um, and we, we need to be very careful, therefore, don't we, in, in, in church life. We've seen the letters to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamos. And we've come to Thyatira. It's the longest of the letters. Thyatira um, wasn't perhaps of the grandeur of those um, earlier places of Ephesus, Smyrna and of Pergamos. Um, perhaps a, a smaller place, very much a place of business. It was known for its business. We, we know about um, Lydia, Acts in chapter 16, and uh, she came from Thyatira. She was a seller of cloth. That's because they, they were big into business in Thyatira. And uh, we, we've uh, seen the strong emphasis that the Lord Jesus Christ knows all that's going on. Now, we saw that in a, you know, we could see that in a negative way, and we'll see something of that tonight. But Um, we saw it in a positive way he knew their love he knew their progress he knew their situation now there is a problem it seems to be very closely bound up and we saw this last Tuesday 
with um, a woman called Jezebel. Now, is that her name? Is that sort of a stylized name? Whatever. Um, but there's a woman, I think that's clear, in the church who seems to have um, usurped uh, you know, some kind of authority to herself. And she's teaching people that they could join in with the wrong and ungodliness around them. And that this was no problem. This was not an issue. We sought to apply that to ourselves. And it's there, isn't it, you know, in our day. Um, sad to say, the word separation has largely gone out of Christian circles. And we, we don't use that word, even if we hold on to what the word means. But that has slipped. And the idea of separation, keeping well away from danger, keeping well away from temptation and difficulty, that, that's, that's very much being pushed into the background. And we apparently can play at different things and try this, that, and the other. Now, that was really the message of this woman. She was uh, saying, well, you can join in with the, the feasts. They were ungodly feasts. They um, involved uh, sexual immorality. There, there were feasts and so, sort of things going on here in Thyatira. And her message was, well, you can join in these things because it'll get you business. It'll get you there. You'll be networking. You'll be part of the crowd. You'll be able to, to do better. Well, there's a a cost to the gospel, isn't there? It's paid by our Lord Jesus Christ, but we have to pay a price too. And sometimes that means that we lose out. Sometimes that means that we have to forego um, friendships that otherwise might be there, business opportunities that might be there, things that we might think to do, but for the sake of the gospel, to keep out of danger, to keep out of temptation's way, <clears throat> to, to, to ally with our Lord Jesus Christ, we, we need to show that we are different. That's the problem, and it's, it's very much a, an up-to-date problem. That's there in our day too. Now, we come back this evening, and we're going to see that the Lord Jesus has some quite severe things to say here, but also that he wants to help those who've kept aside from uh, this kind of nonsense. So three headings tonight. The annoyance. The annoyance God pronounces. We'll see that the Lord Jesus Christ is anointed. Is sorry, is annoyed um, here this evening. The anger, the anger God portrays, and, and it's more than annoyance. The Lord Jesus is angry, and the aid then, the aid God promises. The annoyance um, God pronounces. The anger God portrays. The aid God promises. Let's begin the annoyance God pronounces. Now, as we come back to Thyatira there this evening, we need to be very clear on the annoyance God pronounces. These seven letters are all characterized by great seriousness. Revelation 2 and 3 is not a place to find amusement, is it? It's a place of great seriousness. We live in a day um, of junk mail. Um, I'm sure you're besieged with junk mail as I am besieged with uh, junk mail. We're surely, surely weary of it. We grow tired of it. Um, we find ourselves bombarded with it. Uh, there's a fair proportion of it, certainly in our house. It's never opened. It's recognized for what it is. It's perfectly clear what it is on the envelope. And I'm afraid it's dismissed before ever that it even gets opened. But these letters, this letter, was serious. And key here is this issue with Jezebel. The situation with Jezebel is spelt out, really, um, in, in its fullness in verse 22. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds. This was a serious situation, and God is serious. The whole Bible tells us that uh, truth over and over again. But the unbelieving world treats the things of God as a joke. Uh, and uh, sad to, to say that's been true down the generations. Perhaps sad to say even more so in our day and generation. Um, God, if you like, is for the weak and the spineless that's what people think. God is for wimps. God is no more than a piece of history. Um, Looking to the churches today, humour seems to form a, a large 
part. Humor seems to be the demand, and so entertainment, and so on. But the things of God are extremely serious. And whilst we can usefully perhaps benefit from little bits and pieces of of humor and so on, and uh, we we love to sing and and so on, that's never going to be the the focus, not in an entertainment way, I trust. Um, The things of God are very serious, very serious indeed. Now, it's no surprise that we find that the things of God are rejected in the unbelieving world. Think of the, the second psalm. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. That's the unbelieving world in which we find ourselves. And no surprise that God and the things of God, our Lord Jesus Christ, These things are dismissed. These things are pushed away. The world doesn't want these things. But add that it's sadly um, forgotten or at least covered over by other things amidst God's professing people in the life of the church. Now, we're here in the New Testament and there are uh, clear examples of God's annoyance in the New Testament. The one perhaps that uh, quickly... Uh, springs to mind is Ananias and Sapphira and you remember that there was great generosity being shown and demonstrated in the life of the church and Ananias and Sapphira wanted to live up to to that image of um, generosity and so on and so they sold a piece of land and they made out that they'd given all the proceeds to the work of God now they didn't need to sell the land and they certainly didn't need to make out that they'd given all the proceeds and they didn't need to give all the proceeds but they wanted to create an impression they lied to the church they lied to Peter and they both of them separately died on the spot but there are many instances aren't there in in the Old Testament Um, there are instances where Um, the the ones again that that come to mind are are those perhaps where the cloud of God is seen to move there's that one I've often alluded to those who've been with me before in Numbers in chapter 12 um, the the story of Miriam and Aaron and and their criticism of Moses and what do we read verse 5 then the Lord came down in the pillar of cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam And they both went forward. This was a serious time. God was annoyed. Hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I the Lord and so on. God is annoyed. There was nonsense going on there amidst God's people. God is annoyed. The cloud moved in. And you remember that the whole work of God was to be held back because of this. Miriam was to turn leprous. Um, uh, Aaron was uh, really to be humiliated before all. But but, uh, the whole work of God was set back. Sometimes we can wonder, why is the work of God set back? Well, maybe that that could be part of the, the reason. God was annoyed. God was annoyed. Is that factored into our thinking, I I wonder? Or or think of Numbers chapter 16, verse 42. And the the story here is that um, there's been an uprising, really, by a number of the Levites. And God's people haven't responded terribly well. God is annoyed about this. And we read in verse 42, there's much in the chapter that we could read, but just at verse 42, now it happened when the congregation had gathered against Moses and Aaron that they turned toward the tabernacle of meeting and suddenly the cloud covered it and the glory of the Lord appeared. I'm focusing on you know, the idea of the cloud there this evening. God pronounced his annoyance. God demonstrated that he was um, annoyed about things. We must never forget that Christ is set before us here as being in the midst of the churches. He's there with love. He's there with care, with concern. He's there with encouragement. The whole book is, um, you know, to, to the end of encouraging the people of God. But that's not to overlook the fact that the people of God can do things that are very uh, seriously wrong and that Christ can be annoyed. Clearly, he can be annoyed. 
It brings home how careful we need to be with God and how seriously we must be warned. We can't afford to play at church. God can be seriously annoyed. The annoyance God pronounces, but it goes further than that. For we need to notice here this evening the anger God portrays. This was a a serious situation for the whole church. But as we can uh, see here, especially especially so for Jezebel. Now, we don't know whether Jezebel was her real name or, as I said, that that was a sort of stylized name picked up from the picture there of the Old Testament, the the wife of Ahab and so on, and the the trouble. You know, she asserted herself. She she, uh, thought that she was going to take power and so on. She did in many ways, and and, and Ahab didn't stand up to to, to her. Um, And maybe it's simply that Jezebel isn't her name, but that's her stylized, as it were, name, uh, the the picture that's being used here. What's key here is that this woman had misled, and and really it's stronger than that. She deceived many people. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you, verse 20, because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, she claimed this for herself, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and to eat things sacrificed to idols. This woman had deceived many people. This woman had misled many people by her lies and by her deceit. And she thereby gathered a following. It seems that she was powerfully persuasive. But make no mistake, God was having none of it and God would catch up. We're told here that she would find herself in a sick bed. Sick bed. God uh, was about to move. Judgment was about to fall. It seems too that her family would know it. We read in verse uh, 23, I will kill her children with death and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. Now, We might think, well, that's her followers, her children, in in that sense. Well, maybe, but verse 22, Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation. So that seems already to take in those who are her followers. So we can't be sure. Is the thought here of children in terms of those who follow her, or literally those who are her Children. Now, you might recoil from that. You, you, might, you might say, well, could God do that to, to, to children and so on? We mustn't forget that God is utterly holy. There are certainly um, you know, examples there in the Old Testament. That, that one from Numbers and chapter 16, I don't want to go back there. But that one in Numbers and chapter 16, um, the, the, the little ones perish. The little ones belonging to, to families there, they perish too. Because God is utterly holy. God is very, very angry. And we mustn't detract from um, this thought of the utter holiness and the potential anger of God. We've um, uh, alluded there on Sunday evening to children before the Heavenly Father and in, in that thought about coming to God in, in prayer and so on, that wonderful opportunity that we can call upon God. God is wonderfully kind. He's wonderfully gracious. But he's not soft or sentimental in the way that we are. And and God can move. And let's go back um, then for for, for a moment. Let's take the time just for a minute to go back. And go back to Numbers in chapter 16. uh, Verse 24. Speak to the congregation and say, Get away from the tents of Korah, Dathan and Abiram. So Moses rose and went to Dathan and Abiram, and the elders of Israel followed him, and he spoke to the congregation, saying, Depart now from the the tents of these wicked men. Touch nothing of theirs, lest you be consumed in all their sins. So they got away from around the tents of Korah, Dathan and Abiram. And Dathan and Abiram came out and stood at the door of their tents with their wives, their sons, and their little children. And Moses said, By this you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them of my own will. Now, you see, this was going to involve even little ones. Verse 29, if these men die naturally like all men, or if they're visited by the common fate of all men, then the Lord has not sent me. But if the Lord creates a new thing, and the earth opens its mouth and swallows them up with all that belongs to them, 
and they go down alive into the pit, then you will understand that these men have rejected the Lord. Verse 31, now it came to pass when he finished speaking all these words that the ground split apart under them and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up with their households and all the men with Korah with all their goods. Now that's exactly what we're talking about, isn't it? That's exactly what we're talking about. There's something similar to that. The story of um, Achan in, 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 in the book of Joshua and in, in, in chapter 7. And do you remember that Achan is in, in involved in wrong? And we read there, then Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, the, uh, the silver, the garments, the wedge of gold, his sons, his daughters, his oxen, his donkeys, and all the rest of it. And they stoned them to, to, to death. And, and you say, wow, this is awful. Well, it was necessary, you see, to declare the, the wrath, to do the justice of God. It would happen with um, the Old Testament Jezebel. It was told way, way beforehand, but we, we have to wait some time for the story to unfold. But in 2 Kings in chapter 9, verse 30, Now when Jehu had come to Israel, to, to Jezreel rather, Jezebel heard of it, and she put paint on her eyes and adorned her head and looked through a, a window. Then as Jehu entered at the gate, she said, Is it peace, Zimri, uh, murderer of your master? And he looked up at the window and said, Who is on my side? So two or three eunuchs looked out at him and he said, throw her down. And she's thrown down and she's eaten by the dogs. Just as God had said way back in 1 Kings and chapter 21. The message, the message is God is to be feared. God is to be feared. Now, I fear that we are losing that message. We're losing that message. Proverbs 1, verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Some of you will have heard me say before, that's the P1 of wisdom. Do you want to be wise? Well, the P1 of wisdom is to fear God. It's to fear God. The commentator, he puts it like this. He says, he is able to expose to view all the darkness of sin that is hidden behind the mask of Godliness. There was a mask of godliness. This woman was wearing a mask of godliness. But there was nonsense going on. There was wrong going on. This, this wasn't straight. This wasn't straightforward. This wasn't truthful. This was deceitful. That's what was going on here. This was deceitful. This was clearly wrong. But it had the mask of godliness. And, and people were taken in. People were persuaded by this. Again, it says the commentator, the Lord announces himself to the congregation as the omniscient and omnipotent judge of evildoers in his church. Now, he's omniscient. He knows it all. Think of Psalm 139. There's no hiding from God. He's omniscient. He's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. It may have seemed that God had held back. He had. It may have seemed... I gave her time to repent. God had been patient, but his patience was running out. Time was quickly passing. And his patience would not last much longer. That's the message that we've got here. Did, did, did this woman think that she could get away with it? You know, was the thought that God was a bit powerless? Well, I don't know. It's crazy. Isn't it? It's quite, it's quite mad to think that she was going to get, get away with teaching people to do these things. It's quite mad. It's quite crazy. And, and so what was the need? Well, there, there was need of fear. That's, that's for sure. But there was need of repentance. Jezebel had been given time. I gave her time to repent. She'd been given time to repent. Others too had been given the opportunity to repent. Or they were being given time to repent. Indeed I will cast her into a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent. Repent um, means a, a, a godly sorrow. A godly sorrow. What do we mean by that? It's, it's a sorrow that turns 
on wrong. It's a sorrow that turns on our wrongdoings. It's a sorrow that is willing to turn on ourselves. Sad to say, this woman went on. It, it brings home for us, and again, this is a message that is slipping somewhat. But it brings home for us that sin is serious, that repentance is needed. And it has to be repentance. Note um, in, in, in all these letters that the Lord Jesus Christ is concerned. There's a, there's a widespread concern here for repentance. Uh, and so uh, chapter 2 verse 5 and, and Ephesus, repent and do the first works. Uh, chapter 16, repent or else I will come to, to you uh, quickly. Verse 16 of chapter uh, 2 or chapter 3. And the letter to Sardis. Remember therefore how you have received and heard hold fast and repent. And it's there in the letter to Laodicea verse 19. As many as I love I rebuke and chasten. Therefore be zealous and repent. Now, <laughs> um, God isn't fixated on repentance. But repentance is necessary. We said this before but we can make sin light. We can fall back on a, a formula that can become a dangerous formula. And we can say, well, it's okay, it's all covered by the blood. And I know what's meant by that. And in the right context and with the right application, we're completely behind that statement. But not where that becomes an excuse, um, sort of a let off, that somehow it doesn't matter and that. You know, we're just forgiven anyway, and, and so we don't need to worry about this. No, sin is serious. And clearly here, sin needs repentance. It needs repentance. I'm sure I've read um, on a, uh, uh, an earlier occasion from the Westminster Confession of Faith, the Evangelical Presbyterian Church tied in to the Westminster Confession of Faith. And, and we read there in the section on repentance, no one should be satisfied with a general repentance only, but it is everyone's duty to endeavour to, to take particular care to repent of his particular sins. God intends us to be serious about repentance. It's a, a serious business. He, he intends us to be uh, serious. Um, and so notice here that God disciplines and seriously he does so graciously he gives time but he's going to discipline now we saw that a few months ago in the context of um, hebrews and that quote from proverbs in chapter um, three so i'm not going to go too far back on that there this evening there's comfort to be drawn from the fact that god disciplines but understand this that god cares enough about us but God cares for his holiness. God cares for his reputation. God cares for his name enough to discipline. We can think about the lives of churches. We can think about, you know, catastrophic things that happen in the life of churches. I think we're probably reluctant to consider that maybe something has been wrong. And we don't look for the explanation. Is there something wrong? We come up with another theory as to how to, we're going to get round this problem. How we're going to you know, get round this difficulty. And so the blessing of God isn't present. And we're, we're just looking for another. We're not willing to think that we might have done something wrong. Whereas this ought to make people think. I will kill her children with death and all the churches shall know. That I am he who searches the minds and hearts. And I will give to each one of you according to your works. God was going to have this out in the open. Because it was important that all the churches understood that he's serious. There needed to be thinking. There needed to be thinking. Remember in the, the book of Haggai. And, and, and uh, God thwarts them. Because they weren't getting on with the building of the temple. They were too busy building their own houses and looking after themselves. And, and God thwarts them and, and um, difficulty comes upon them and their harvest was coming to nothing. And what does God say? Consider your ways. Well, uh, the church here in Thyatira, but the church wide, wider, in a wider way, needs to consider its ways. God can be annoyed. God can be angry. 
Now, there is also the promise here of aid. So notice the recognition in verse 24, turning the page on my Bible. Now, to you, I say, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden, but hold fast what you have till I come. Wonderfully comforting there. There were those in the church who had kept themselves away. There were those in the church who'd kept their distance. And the Lord Jesus Christ, who knows their love, who knows their works, who knows their growth, knows that they're not involved in all of this. And he's here now to help them. There was already a great burden in Thyatira for these godly souls. And the Lord, it seems, is not going to add to it. Um, the Christian life is tough, isn't it? And there are many problems and many setbacks and there's many a weight to be carried in the Christian life. But, but God doesn't overburden us. Um, you know that text in, in 1 Corinthians and, and uh, chapter 11 um, springs to, 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 to mind. Uh, chapter 10, rather, sorry. <laughs> springs to mind. I knew that was wrong. Uh, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted and so on. But with the temptation will also make a way of escape. God was going to help them. God was going to help them. Notice that God looks for them to persevere. He wants them to persevere. Verse 25. But hold fast what you have till I come. And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end... To him will I give power over the nation. Sometimes persevering is a, is a tough call. That theme of overcoming, that theme of persevering is, is very much uh, one common to these uh, uh, seven letters. They all, in a sense, involve persevering. Perseverance was necessary. They, they needed to endure God looks for us to persevere. I'm not going to go through um, all all the letters there this evening, but they all include this thought about um, overcoming, persevering, keeping going. What does it say to us that God looks for us to persevere? Life was tough for the godly uh, folk in Thyatira. These who professed to be Christians had slipped. They were up to nonsense. Awful things were going on. And they were taking their stand. And it was tough. It was hard. But the Christian is marked out, you see, in that he perseveres. Imagine what it was like for these folk. They must have felt the the awful turmoil there in the church. They they must have been, um, you know, looked down upon. I'm sure this woman um, stirred it up. And, you know, they must have been looked down upon as the sort of have-nots and so on. They, 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 were, they, were, they, they were out, if you like, the, the have-nots. They, they must at times have been left wondering if they were in the right. Sometimes when you've got to take a stand for things in reference to the Bible and so on. And there are folk against you. You can be left wondering, are you right? And especially when your, your cause seems to fail. To persevere here um, was no mean thing. But how encouraging. God sees and God knows. And God is going to come and help them. There's a, a further help here, further encouragement. For Christ would give them power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels. It's a, it's a quote from Psalm 2. I'm not going to go into the detail of that this evening. But it's a quote from Psalm 2. And um, verse 9, actually, and part of Psalm 2, of course, speaks of the, the, the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so put scripture with scripture. The psalm speaks of the heathen raging and, and uh, imagining a vain thing and, and so on. And how the people of God are under pressure. And they succeed in putting the Lord Jesus Christ to death, but he rose. Um, the son was denied as it were on the cross but declared to be the son of God with power in the resurrection and by virtue of his work he overcomes the nations and so the promise is 
um, being picked up here, that they too would overcome and have a part in the victory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it's not easy to believe um, in victory. And it's not easy in the Christian life to, to, to believe that we're going to be victorious. You have to hold on to promises like the earth will be filled with the knowledge of God as the waters cover the sea. So easy for people to be negative, to be full of negativity and only to breed discouragement. We have to hold on to the wonderful promises of God. There'll be those from, yeah, that's another one I delight in, those from every tribe and tongue and nation under heaven gathered on that glorious day. And you've got it there in in First John, haven't you? And in, um, in, in in chapter three, and it's a passage we love. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are children of God. It's not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And we've got this wonderful hope. People with this hope, says John. They purify themselves just as he is pure. They're serious about walking with God. Now, um, here's wonderful hope for the child of God. He could seem to be in defeat, but he's not. And notice that God gives the morning star. I also have received, as I also have received from my father, and I will give him the morning star. This is the star that shines there in the morning. Um, there's uh, 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 an allusion to the to the book of Daniel there, uh, to chapter 12, and uh, to verse 3. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Um, the, the promise is that the saints will shine forth in brilliance. And it may be that... Um, you know, they're, they're viewed in a negative way. It, it may be that they're disdained, they're mocked, they're ridiculed. They have to face great trouble for the cause of standing firm. It may be that for now they're maligned and they're looked down upon and they bear plentiful burdens. Um, doubtless they were ridiculed by Jezebel and her followers as nothings. Doubtless. But they would appear shining in holiness with the one who is utterly holy and who searches the hearts the message this evening well first of all god is to be feared people make light they laugh we all love to laugh don't misunderstand me um you know we don't want church life to be due to the, the sense that it becomes depressing don't misunderstand me for a moment um but here was essentially a, a mockery of the things of God. They were bringing the things of God into a mockery. We need to, to live in the fear of God. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And then that God wants us to persevere, to endure unto the end. Make no mistake about it, God was annoyed, God was angry. And God will deal with things in his good time. But these folk needed to persevere, to endure to the end, to plod on despite the many problems, the many frustrations, the hurt and the pain that they bore from people who were still in the church but who were causing trouble in the church. They, they went to give up. They were to endure the discouragements. It's not an easy thing to endure discouragements. It's not an easy thing to, to be let down, um, to feel that growing frustration. But the message is, don't give up. We're to run the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus. Let's turn to God in prayer. Father, we pray for grace to uh, run the race that is set before us. We pray for your help not to be discouraged, not to be overwhelmed, not to be disappointed, but Lord, to run that race, to look unto Jesus, to be faithful, to be faithful to your word, to be faithful to your truth, to be faithful to our Lord Jesus Christ, to honour him in our lives day by day, to bring him glory and praise, to live in the fear of God, our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.